have a lot to cover. Okay. I did not, I think, do justice to Macbeth, and I hope I do justice to this, because this is an even richer, fuller play. I said we're going to skip over the comic bits to save time and get to the meat of the story, but Shakespeare was a genius in the way he blended the comic bits with the serious bits in this play. And if you get a chance to read it and to look it over for yourself, you'll see the comedy interlaced and intertwined throughout. And indeed, it comes in at the very end again, when, when the stage, when at, at the climactic moment of triumph over the enemy, then we get the little comic bit woven in again. And it's beautifully done. But we will jump most of the comic bits. This is the story of three men named Henry. Henry IV, the king, the Plantagenet king, who was Earl of uh, Duke of Lancaster, and who ousted his predecessor, Richard II, who was a weak kneed uh, they always say effeminate. Uh, well, I'll tell you how effeminate he was. The, um, the fork, the table fork, was invented during the period of Henry, uh, 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 Richard II. It was a French invention. Up to that time, you stabbed your food with a knife and pulled it off the knife. But, but they used a table fork, and that was a, a nicety introduced by Richard, who, who couldn't soil his hands with that stabbing thing. He played favorites. He made a lot of enemies. He uh, was running the country. He was giving away with both hands uh, territory that the English considered to be theirs. He was ceding to the French the ancestral rights of William the Conqueror, and they didn't like it. And eventually, the nobility, led by Henry, Henry Bolingbroke, the Duke of Lancaster, rose up against him and deposed him. But you might depose a king, but you don't kill him, because God puts the king on the throne. At least that was the theory. Uh, and so you, you, you committed a, a mortal sin if you were involved in killing the king after he was deposed. You ran enough, your immortal soul was in enough danger just getting him off the throne. But Henry made the mistake of saying in front of two of his nobles, he had Richard under house arrest and he had taken the throne. And he made the mistake of saying in front of <coughs> two of his boot-licking nobles, oh, who will rid me of this, this burden, meaning Richard. And they took it seriously and went in and murdered Richard. And as the play opens, Henry is telling us that he, he's old and tired and he needs to go on a crusade to clean, cleanse his spirit of this sin. And the sin he's talking about, the murder of Richard II, his predecessor, which he may or may not have been probably was directly responsible for. <laughs> the second Henry is his son, also named Henry, called Prince Hal in this, um, or Harry, uh, the two nicknames. And he's probably in his late teens. Um, and he's living a dissolute life. I think I told you before that the part that we're skipping involves his interaction with Falstaff, the fat rogue who is his drinking buddy at the taverns. But Falstaff and his friends and the prince go out roistering all the time, and he has a reputation of being worthless. And the king is dismayed, because the third Henry is the son of a shirt-tailed relative. All the Plantagenets were, were connected to this earl and that duke and this earl and that duke. Through, through a marriage here and a marriage there, uh, the Percy's of Northumberland. And uh, their son, who was just about the same age as Prince Hal, also Henry, was called Henry Hotspur. Hotspur because he was um, impetuous, quick to anger, quick to pick a fight, marvelous swordsman, wonderful fighter. Uh, and made his daddy proud with the number of victories he had in battle. In fact, as the play opens, he has recently led the English forces against the Scots who had rebelled. They didn't, they didn't take a vote 
on whether or not to stay with England. They simply rebelled, led by uh, such as the, the Earl of Douglas. And he has won, and he has all these Scottish prisoners. And one of the bones of contention, Henry IV wants those prisoners for the ransom, of course, for the exchequer. And uh, Hotspur is not about to yield his prisoners. He wants, he took them, he's going to get the ransom, he's going to have the honor, he's going to get the ransom. And the king says, bring me your prisoners. And he says, in a pig's eye, I will not. And he defies the king. But he's still a more admirable character in the king's eye because he's a man, a real man, as opposed to my son, the weak-kneed wastrel. <laughs> And so the play opens with the three Henrys, and Henry IV saying, I want to go on a crusade to cleanse my soul. But Westmoreland, the Earl of Westmoreland, one of his nobles, says, you've got a problem. Your cousin, the Earl of Mortimer, um, <coughs> you sent him to, to fight Owen Glendower, because the, not only were the Scots rebelling in the north, but the uh, Welch were rebelling in the West, and they were led by a uh, mysterious commander called Owen Glendower, uh, who traded on the fact that he was supposed to be a magician, that he had magical powers, and he, he, his followers were terrified of him. Um, the wild and irregular Glendower, uh, well, Mortimer, is taken by Glendower. That's the bad news. There's no good news out of there. Um, he, and uh, the king says, you make me sad and makes me sin in envy that when my lord Northumberland should be the father to so bless the son, oh that my young Harry it could be proved that some night-tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle clothes our children where they lay and called mine Percy his Plantagenet. Then I would have his Harry and he be mine. But he got to give me his prisoners. Send me word I shall have, he sends me word I shall have none but Mordrick, Earl of Fife. He's hanging on to the rest of his prisoners. And Westmoreland says, that's not him speaking, that's his father and his uncle. His father and his uncle. Uh, his uncle is a man called Worcester, the Earl of Worcester, and he is one of the enemies of Henry IV. He doesn't like him. He's suspicious of him. He thinks he's up to no... Henry IV had beset all around by shirt-tail relatives who all ate his guts. It's a sad situation. Uh, in the second scene, you switch to the apartments, the prince's apartments, in the palace. And I suppose we went up onto the balcony, and he's talking with Falstaff about this robbery. I told you earlier on that they planned a robbery of the king's exchequer, and the prince agrees to go along with it, because after all, it's no robbery, it's my money after all. Uh, which he has to do... Uh, Shakespeare is a is a is a suck up to the Plantagenets. He really loved the Plantagenets. He did not like he liked the House of Lancaster. He didn't like the House of York, which was represented by Richard III, and they were de put down by the Tudors. So, being a loyal Tudor man, he hates the Yorkists. He likes the Lancasters. So, in this. He is very much in favor of Henry IV and the fact that um, uh, he, he, he's, uh, let's see, where was I going with that? Oh, I know what I was going. The, after they plan the robbery, the prince has a soliloquy and tells the audience what he's up to. All his friends have left the stage, farewell my lord. And the prince says, I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein do I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world. But when, when he please again to be himself, being wanted, 
he may be the more wondered at. If all the world, if all the year we're playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. So when this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I never promised, by how much better than my word I am, by so much shall I falsify man's hopes. They're hoping that I'll be a failure. But I'm going to surprise them all. What is the debt he never promised? To be the king. To, 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 to take the country into his charge and to be the father to the country. He was born to that. He didn't, he didn't take that on voluntarily, unlike his father who did. I also offend to make offense a skill, redeeming time when men least think I will. This is all an act. You may think that a little bit cold, but Shakespeare thought it was lovely. Then we meet Hotspur in the very next scene, and by contrast. Um, my leech, I did deny no prisoners. When I was dry with rage and extreme toil, there came a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom. He was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a punset box, which ever and anon he gave his nose and took it away again because of the smell of the dead bodies. And ever and again, he still he smiled, and as the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untaught knaves unmannerly to bring a slovenly, unhandsome corpse betwixt the wind and his nobility. He demanded my prisoners on your majesty's behalf, and I then, all smarting and my wounds being cold, out of my grief and my impatience, I answered, neglectingly, I know not what. He made me mad to see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet. He said, but for these vile cuts, he would be a soldier himself. And the king said, well, that's all very well, but you're still not giving me your prisoners. You want me to ransom Mortimer. He's not only the king's cousin, he is also the brother-in-law of Hotspur, who has married Mortimer's sister. And you come to me and you say, you're not going to give me the prisoners, but get Mortimer out of Glendower's hands. Pay the ransom. He's, he's not a rebel. He never did fall off. He did confound the best part of an hour with the great, great Glendower. And the king says, you do belie him. He never did encounter with Glendower. Let me not hear you speak of Mortimer. Send me your prisoners with the speediest means. My lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send us your prisoners or you will hear of it. And out he sweeps. And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them. Speak of Mortimer, I will speak of him and let my soul want mercy if I do not join with him. This unthankful king, this ingrate. Ah, now we see why they're so upset with the king. They think they helped the king to the throne. They think, and they did. They sent their powers to fight on his behalf against Richard II. He owes us. He owes us. And look at him. He, now he wants our prisoners. Now he says, don't talk about your brother-in-law. Uh, and Hotspur says, uh, Worcester says, Worcester is the uncle, I cannot blame him, was not he proclaimed, he, Mortimer, proclaimed by Richard that dead is the next of blood. And Northumberland says, oh, he was. I heard the proclamation. Now they're claiming that Henry IV has taken the throne and he should belong to Mortimer. It's no wonder Henry IV doesn't trust them, doesn't trust Mortimer, feels himself beset. <laughs> uh, so when Northumberland, the father, Hotspur's father, leaves the stage, he leaves the scheming uncle alone with Hotspur, and the uncle works on him. Good cousin, give me audience a while. These same noble Scots that are your prisoners, I'll keep them all, by God, he shall not have a one of them. No, if a Scot would save his soul, he shall not. I'll keep them. Nay, I will. That's flat. Uh, 
And this same sword and buckler, Prince of Wales, but that I think his father loves him not, and would be glad if he met of some mischance, I'd have him poisoned with a pot of ale. Okay, I can't talk to you when you're like this. I'm leaving. Well, no, 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 it's, I, I'll shut up. Talk to me. And he does. He suggests that they form a confederacy against the king. Tis no little reason bids us speed to save our heads by raising of a head. For bear ourselves as even as we can, the king will always think him in our debt. He'll always think we know that he owes us the throne. We'll never be safe. He'll do away with us, I swear with you. I told you I would skip the Falstaff scenes, and there's a Falstaff scene next uh, where they set up and execute the robbery. But we'll skip, we'll skip ahead, and we'll go where Hotspur is in his own castle. And he's reading a letter. And somebody has refused to join him and his uncle and his father against the king. And they have written, and he's quoting, the purpose you undertake is dangerous. <laughs> That's certain. It is dangerous to take a cold, to sleep, to drink. But I tell you, my lord, fool out of this nettle danger, we pluck the flower safety. The purpose you undertake is dangerous. Never mind. If they won't, we'll do it on our own without them. Charming little scene, which again, we'll skip because there isn't time to go over the love between Hotspur, Henry Percy, and his wife. It's a delightful little scene in which he agrees to let her accompany him. I wouldn't want to accompany my husband onto the field of battle. I wouldn't want to pack up and go to Afghanistan if my husband were deployed. But women did in those days, no women of nobility. Uh, and they, they traveled and they stayed back behind the front lines and gallantry forbade that they should be bothered by the, the enemy if the enemy broke the line and took the force. The lady was sent home, of course, safely. Gallantry was such. Um, but in this scene, in, in, in the next scene, Hal and his friends are back at the tavern. First you have the robbery, then you have the conspiracy, then you have the robbery having been accomplished again, they're talking about. And this is the scene in which I told you that over and over again, Falstaff exaggerates how many men he fought with. Uh, there were five. There were there, there were five. The, the, uh, no, excuse me. There were four rogues in Buckram. Four? Why thou says but two even not. Four. I told thee four. These four came in front and thrust at me, and I made no more ado, but took all their seven swords on my what seven? There were but four uh, in Buckram. I in buckram suits. Oh no, seven. Seven, or I'm a villain else. Now, these nine men in buckram that I told you of, and he, the, the, the number that he fought against grows and grows and grows. And in passing, they do introduce one of the people who will <coughs> later in the play, Douglas the Scot, who was one of uh, the prisoners taken in the Scottish Rebellion who later throws in his lot with Harry Percy and Northumberland. Um, Falstaff mentions him. <clears throat> Scott of Scots, Douglas, that runs a horseback up a hill perpendicular. <laughs> uh-huh, says the prince. He that rides at high speed and with his pistol kills a sparrow flying. And Falstaff says, you hit it. And the prince says, so did he never the sparrow. He, he can tell you all these tales, but he didn't do them. He's a braggart. He's a braggart like Hotspur. And so the famous scene that they play at this point 
is one that you may have seen depicted on, in ads for this play. They pretend to be the king and Prince Hal. First one of them, first Falstaff is, is the, uh, Prince Hal, and, and Prince Hal is the king, and he puts a cushion on his head for a crown. <laughs> and Falstaff pleads the case of Sir John Falstaff, a good man and true. And uh, Hal, as the king, threatens to, to uh, uh, banish him. And Falstaff says, no, no, then let me be the king. And he's the king. He's a good man, Falstaff. You, you stick with him. You, he'll teach you a lot, young man, to his, the prince. And it's, it's an amusing little scene. And it stitches together that and the next scene, which is back again with Hotspur. First Henry, then Hotspur. First Henry, then Hotspur. First, first the king's forces, then the rebels. Nicely put together, one after the other. Now we're at Glendower's uh, castle in Wales. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> Mortimer has been treated so nicely, and though he speaks no Welsh, she has fallen in love with, well, it may have been a judicious marriage, but he's fallen in love with his captor's daughter, Glendower's daughter, and they have married. And she speaks no English, and he speaks no Welsh. It's so interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> but Henry Hotspur has come with his uncle Worcester to make sure that Glendower knows what they're going to do, that they're going to rebel against the king, and that he will promise to send his forces to back them up. But Hotspur can't keep his mouth shut. He can't be judicious. He can't, he can't be a peacemaker. He has got to speak what he sees to be the truth. And he so alienates Glendower in this scene that when the battle is joined and they're ready to go, Glendower just can't get his men there for another two weeks. It'll be two weeks at least. He said, you better, better hold off. And of course he can't hold off. He's face to face with the king's forces. He has to go to the battle. And it's a wonderful scene. Glendower. <coughs> Pays a very pleasant compliment to Harry Percy. Sit, cousin Percy, sit, good cousin Hotspur, for by that name, as oft as Lancaster does speak of you, his cheek looks pale, and with a rising sigh he wisheth you in heaven, and you in hell, as often as he hears Owen Glendower spoke of. And Glendower preems himself, says, Well, I cannot blame him. At my nativity, the font of heaven was full of fiery shapes, of burning cressets, and at my birth, the frame and huge foundation of the earth did shake like a coward. And most of the Welsh would say, but not Hotspur. Hotspur says, so it would have done in the same season if your mother's cat had kittened. <laughs> <laughs> and Glendower takes deep offense. I say the earth did shake when I was born. And Hotspur says, and I say the earth was not of my mind, if you suppose that fearing you, it shook. And Glendower said, the heavens were all on fire, the earth did tremble. And Hotspur has at him again, rude as usual. And Glendower says, cousin of many men, I do not bear these crossings. Give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth, the font of heaven was full of fiery shapes. And Hotspur says, Oh, I think there's no man speaks better Welsh. Out to dinner. <laughs> I can call spirits from the vasty deep. And Hotspur says, Well, so can I. And so can any man. But will they come when you call for them? <laughs> <laughs> and Mortimer says, Stop this. Stop it. Come, come. No more of this chat. And Glendara pulls himself together. All right, here's a map. Let's divide the territory that we're going to take from the king. Let's figure out who's... who's and Hotspur usually played this way. He stands clear of it, but he looks, he just takes a peek at the map from a distance, pretending not to be interested. And then he says, methinks my moiety, north from Burton, Burton's a river, 
uh, from a, a town on the Trent. Methinks my moiety north from Burton here in quality, e quantity equals not one of yours. See how the river comes cranking in? I'll have the current in this place dammed up and a new channel cut. And Glendower says, no, it not wind, it shall, it must, it doth. He's, of course, a natural magician. He, 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 the forces of nature are sacred to Glendower. But Hotspur says, I'll have it so. A little charge will do it. We'll just set dynamite there and we'll change the course of the river. No, you shall not. I will not have it altered. You shall not. And who shall say me nay? I will. Well, let me not understand you then. Speak it in Welsh. I can speak English as well as you. And finally he gets control of himself again. Glenn Dower is wonderful. Come. You shall have Trent change, the river Trent change. And Hotspur says, eh, I don't care. I'll give thee thrice so much land to any well-deserving friend. And Bornemer says, you can't talk that way to him. How you cross my father? Oh, sometimes he angers me. Well, he holds your temper in high respect and curbs himself even at his natural scope. I warrant you there is not a man alive might so have tempered him as you have done. Oh, well. Good manners. Be your speed. Here come our wives. Let's take our leave. And by so doing, of course, he has sealed his own doom by acting like an idiot, by being so spoiled and so self-centered, and by being so insulting. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, this is, this is Shakespeare's wonderful strength to move from one place <coughs> to another, from the banqueting room in the, in the Welsh castle, and suddenly he's back in the palace of Westminster. And the king says, everybody, out. The Prince of Wales and I must have some private conference. Here's the scene that I prepared you for that I told you of, in which he says to his son, had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, opinion that did help me to the crown, had still kept loyal to possession. By being seldom seen, I could not stir, but like a comet, I was wondered at. Thus did I keep my presence fresh and new, ne'er seen but wondered at. The skippy king, he ambled up and down with shallow jests and rash babbling wits, soon kindled, soon burnt. And being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they surfeited with honey and began to loathe the taste of sweetness whereof a little more than a little is by much too much. I didn't act the way you act. You're out and about. People get tired of seeing you. I held myself to myself. I was dignified. The king made a fool of himself. And they tired of him. But I behaved differently when I was your age. For all the world as thou art to this hour was Richard then. And even so, and even as I was then, is Percy now. Being no more in debt to years than thou, leads ancient nor lords and reverend bishops on. And by doing that, the king has also bought the eternal enmity, enmity of the Prince of Wales for Hotspur. Why can't you be like the neighbor's kid? Why can't you be like me? that? But wherein do I tell this news to thee? Why, Harry, do I tell thee of my foes which aren't my nearest and dearest foe? You'd like to take the throne, wouldn't you? And the prince finally speaks seriously, not just a word here and a word there. Do not think so. You shall not find it so. God forgive them that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's head. And by the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son, not Percy. 
Well, I will be happy if that is so. And so they get their forces together, pull their forces together, and get up an army to battle Northumberland, led by Percy, uh, Harry Percy, Hotspur, the Welsh forces, the Scots, all in rebellion, all in north of England, Scotland and Wales. The loyal, loyal counties are those close to London. But Hotspur is having a problem. He gets a letter, a letter from my father? Why comes he not himself? Mm -hmm. um, he cannot come, my lord, he is grievous sick. Sounds how has he the leisure to be sick? Who leads his powers? Your father's not coming, and he's not sending his army. Sick now, droop now. That sickness stuff infect the very lifeblood of our enterprise. And Worcester says, I think we, we ought to delay fighting the English, you know? This is the uncle speaking, the, the perfidious uncle. Your father's sickness is a maim to us. Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all in one cast? To set so rich a main on so nice a hazard in one doubtful hour? Well, we can do it, said Hotspur. I, I tell you, we can do it. The Welsh will be here to help us. The Welsh and the Scots. Uh, yet I would your father had been here, says Uncle Worcester, the snake. The absence of your father draws a curtain that shows an ignorant, the ignorant a kind of fear. The ordinary soldiers are going to be afraid when they hear that your father's not there with his troops. And Hotspur says, no. I rather of his absence make this use. It lends a luster and a more great opinion, a larger dare to our great enterprise. For men must think, if we without his help can make a head, that is, can make headway, to push against a kingdom, with his help we shall our turn it topsy-turvy down. <coughs> Let them come. They come like sacrifices in their trim to the fire-eyed maid of smoky war. I am on fire. Harry to Harry shall hot horse to horse meet and ne'er part till one drops down a course. <sighs> but I wish Glendale were here. Well, says Vernon, who is another sidekick of the perfidious Uncle Worcester, there is more news. I learned as I drove along, as I rode along, he cannot draw his power for 14 days. That rocks him back on his heels, but he takes courage. My father and Glendower being both away, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Come, let us take a muster speedily. Doomsday is near. Die all, die merrily. And we, I have to share this bit, Falstaff bit with you, even though I said I wasn't going to put any of the Falstaff in. But Falstaff has been given a, a chunk of money by the Prince of Wales and told to gather a force. Uh, this is how they did it. The, 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 you appoint a captain, and he went out and he paid guys to come and soldier for this campaign. And here comes Falstaff with his his troops, and they're awful. They're lame, they're halt, they're blind, they're, they're in rags. And he says, if I be not ashamed of my soldiers, I'm a soused gurnet. That is a pickled herring. I have misused the king's press damnably. I have got in exchange of 150 soldiers, 300 odd pounds. I got 300 pounds, so I didn't pay anything like that to get these guys. I pressed me none but good householders, women's sons, contracted <laughs> bachelors such as had been, that had been asked twice in the bands, such a commodity of warm slaves as had leave here the devil as a drum. So they buy their way out. 
they buy these soldiers that I have, and now my whole charge consists of ancients, the corporals, lieutenants, gentlemen of companies, slaves as ragged as Lazarus in a painted cloth, discarded unjust servants, younger sons to younger brothers, revolting <coughs> tapsters, ostlers, trade folk, ostlers, uh, uh, horse handlers who have been fired. 150 tattered prodigals. And the villains march wide betwixt the legs as if they had jives on. For indeed, I had most of them off, off, out of prison. They were, they were off the chain gang. And they're still walking as though they were wearing the chains. Uh, the audience enjoyed that very much. The English didn't get over getting their troops for battle that way for a long time. The Duke of Wellington went out to see his troops just before the Battle of Waterloo. And he walked up and down and he looked at this moth-eaten, villainous, dirty, smelly, ragged crew. And he said, he's reputed to have said, well, I do not know if they will frighten the enemy, but by God, sir, they frighten me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, as is usual, they send messengers back and forth before the battle. The king hath sent to know the nature of your griefs, if that the king have any way your good deserts forgot, which he confesseth, confesseth to, I don't know how they said things like that, <laughs> to be manifold, he bids you name them, and with all good speed you shall have your desires with interest. We, we don't want to fight. The king doesn't want to fight. He says he'll give you whatever it is you want. And Hotspur says the king is kind, and well, we know the king knows at what time to promise when to pay. My father, my uncle, myself did give him the same royalty he wears. I heard him swear and vow to God he came but to be Duke of Lancaster. But he's king, isn't he? He's king. In short time after he deposed the king, soon after that, deprived him of his life. <laughs> suffered his kinsman March, that is the early morning, to be engaged in Wales, disgraced me in my happy victories, claiming the, the, the Scottish prisoners, enraged, dismissed my father from the court, broke oath on oath, committed wrong on wrong. He's not going to be, he's not going to accept. Um, So the morning of the battle comes, and the king starts the last scene of the last act. How bloodily the sun begins to peer above yon busky hill. The day looks pale. Uh, in come Worcester and Vernon. They are messengers from Hotspur's camp, and they have come to say, we are going to fight. We don't believe you. And the king says to them, you have de deceived our trust and made us doff our easy robes of peace to crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. This is not well, my lord, this is not well. What say you to it? Uncle Worcester is having second thoughts. He started this whole thing. He pushed Hotspur from the beginning to go for it. Now he says to the king, For my own part, I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life with quiet hours. For I do protest, I have not sought this day of the day of this dislike. You have not sought it? How comes it then? Falstaff, who's standing there over there at one side with the other captains, has an aside here, which I think is wonderful. And I don't, he obviously is not heard by the king, not supposed to be heard by the king. You have not sought it, says the king, how comes it then? And Falstaff says, oh, rebellion lay in his way, and he found it. You've been defaming me up and down the country, says the king. These things you have articulate, proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, to face the garments of rebellion with some fine color that may please the eye. You've been claiming that I had the king killed. 
And the prince steps forward and says, look, how about single combat between me and Oscar? I do not think a braver gentleman, more active valiant, or more valiant young, more daring, or more bold is now alive. I am content to save the blood on either side. Try fortune with him in a single fight. And the king says, I'll go with that. Will they take the offer of our grace, both he and they and you? Yea, every man shall be my friend again, and I'll be his. So tell our cousin, and I'll go Worcester and Vernon. And the court disperses, each to their battle station, leaving Falstaff alone on stage with Prince Hal. Hal, if thou see me down in battle, bestride me so. It is a point of friendship. Uh, a knight, when he went down in that awful armor, couldn't get up very readily. He had to go over on all fours and scramble up. A knight off his horse was in, in tr real trouble. And they had a way, uh, they fought him on the buddy system kind of. They, they fought in pairs. And the other one would dismount and stand astride the, the fallen knight. <laughs> Very awkward position. But he would defend him while this guy scrambled to his hands and knees and got himself up again so that he could defend himself. And that's what Hal, uh, uh, Falstaff is saying. If I go down, will you bestride me? And the prince says, nothing but a colossus can do thee that friendship. <laughs> Say thy prayers and farewell. Oh, says Falstaff, I would to a bedtime, Hal, and all well. And the prince says, thou owest God in death. That's the soldier's creed in, in, in this period. You owe God your life, you owe God your death. And out he goes. And Falstaff says, "'Tis not due yet. I would be loath to pay him before his day." <laughs> well, it is no matter. Honor pricks me on. The reason I'm reading you this speech is because of this speech, this scene. How then? But how, if honor prick me on, off when I come on? How then? Can honor set a leg? No. An arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then? No. So what is honor? A word. What is that word honor? What is that honor? Air. Who hath it? He that died the Wednesday. Doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Therefore I'll none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon, and so ends my catechism. And we know where he stands. He's not going to stand to the last man. But Worcester and Vernon, carrying the, king, the prince's message to Hotspur, let's do single combat and get this whole thing over with. Get this whole war over with. Just the two of us. And Worcester, what a snake he is. What a wonderful role for an actor. <coughs> he grabs his friend Vernon and he says, my nephew must not know, Sir Richard, the liberal and kind offer of the king then we are all undone. It is not possible, it cannot be, the king should keep his word in loving us. He will suspect us still and find a time to punish this offense to further, in other faults. Treason is but trusted like the fox, who ne'er so tame, so cherished and locked up, will have a wild trick of his ancestors. My nephew's trespass will be well forgot. It hath the excuse of youth and the heat of blood. But we, as the spring of all, that is the wellspring, shall pay for all. Let not Harry know in any case the offer of the king. So in comes Hotspur with his, now his friend, formerly his prisoner, now his friend, Douglas, the Scot. With at least Douglas and the Scots are there. And he says, what did you hear? And Worcester says, the king will bid you battle presently. Yes, boo. The Prince of Wales stepped forth before the king and nephew challenged you to single fight. 
I, I, I'll tell him, I won't tell him that we, we would be forgiven if that And the Hotspur says, oh, would the quarrel would lay upon our heads, and that no man might draw a short breath today. Well, he spoke well of you, he did. Well, I'll look for him in the battle, says Hotspur. And wonderful speech by which Hotspur faces the battle. Oh, gentlemen, the time of life is short. To spend that shortness basely were too long if life did ride upon a dial's point, still ending at the arrival of an hour. And if we live, we live to tread on kings. If die, brave death when princes die with us. All for gallantry. That's Hotspur. And so the battle begins. And the Elizabethan battle on stage was really a wonderful thing. They run in from one door, they run in from the other door, they fight, they run out that door, they run it, somebody else runs in this door. It's, it's a mess on stage. And you only know them by the, the, uh, the colors they carry, the armor they're wearing. So, Blunt. Uh, one of the king's men uh, comes in. He's wearing the king's colors. That was very common, I guess you know, for other noblemen to go disguised as the king. Because, of course, they always aim to get at, to kidnap, or to kill the king. And so, Sir Walter Blunt is wearing the king's colors. And he meets Douglas. The Scot. Uh, and Doug, they fight, and Douglas kills Blunt. And, oh, and Hotspur comes in then. And, oh, Douglas, has thou fought at Holmden thus? They, they, that was where they fought each other, at Holmden. Oh, Douglas, had thou fought at Holmden thus, I never would have triumphed on a Scot. All's done, all's won. Here breathless lies the king. Where, says Hotspur. Here, here. This Douglas. No, I know this face full well. A gallant knight he was. His name is Blunt. Semblably furnished like the king himself. Huh, says Douglas. A fool go with thy soul, whither it goest. A borrowed title thou hast bought too dear. Why did thou tell me thou wast the king? Hotspur says, the king hath many marching in his coats today. Well, now by my sword, <clears throat> I will kill all his coats. I'll murder all his wardrobe, one piece by piece. And out he strides. The king uh, and the prince meet, and Prince Harry has been wounded. And uh, the king says, get off the battlefield, get that tended to. And the prince says, no, God forbid a shallow scratch should drive the prince of Wales from such a field as this. It's a, it's a mere flesh wound, you know the line, from the westerns. They get shot. They, nobody, no villain in a western movie ever shot straight. They shoot cross-eyed because they always get the hero in the shoulder, right? And he said, he fluffs it off. A mere flesh wound, and then he fights with the other hand. Well, that's exactly what Shakespeare created. It's, it, it's an old device. It's as old as Henry IV, Part One, at least. God forbid a shallow scratch should drive the Prince of Wales from a field like this. Um, out he goes, and Douglas comes in again, and this time he sees the king. Ah! Another king, the girl like Hydra's heads. I am Douglas, fatal to all those who wear those colors on them. What art thou, the counterfeit, the person of a king? I am the king himself, who Douglas grieves to hear so many of his shadows thou hast met. And they fight. The king is in danger, as it says, as the stage direction says, the king is in danger when re-enter the Prince of Wales. And he jumps in and fights and drives away Douglas. Thou hast redeemed thy lost opinion in this fair rescue, 
says the king. And the prince says, Oh God, they did me too much injury that ever said I hearken for your death. If it were so, I might have let alone the insulting hand of Douglas. No, I, I never conspired against you. Out goes the king and enter hospital. My name is Harry Percy and I am the Prince of Wales. Think not, Percy, to share with me in glory anymore. Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere. And they fight. And of course, you know, the prince wins. And Hotspur is mortally wounded, drops to his knees, and he has, as in the opera, one last speech in him. Oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. And he, he speaks, Oh, Percy, thou art dust and food for... And he dies. And the prince finishes the line. Nice, nice bit of writing there. And food for... For worms, brave Percy, fare thee well, great heart. And he gives this... I have seen this actually... I can't remember whose tombstone this is graven on. It's a lovely tribute. Ill-weaved ambition, how much art thou shrunk, he says. But that was not what was on the tombstone. This is what was on the tombstone. When that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom, for it was too small a bound, but now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. Thy ignominy sleep with thee in thy grave, but not remembered in thy epitaph. And he turns around, and there, back, in the corner is Falstaff. Falstaff came in during the big battle. Prince and Hotspur were having at it. And he went over and he played dead over in the corner. <laughs> and he's still over there playing possum. And the king sees him, <coughs> and the prince sees him, and oh, poor Jack, farewell. I could have spared a better man. And he goes out, and Falstaff gets up. The better part of valor is discretion. <laughs> In which better part? I have saved my life. Uh, 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 Sounds. I'm afraid of this gunpowder Percy. Though he be dead, what if he should counterfeit too and rise? By my faith, I'm afraid he would be the better counterfeiter. Therefore, I'll make him sure. And I'll swear I killed him. And he takes out his dagger and he stabs the dead the dead body over and over and over and then he drags the dead body and throws it down the king and his court are enter and he throws it down there is Percy if your father will do me the honor so oh excuse me first first he does this for hell for Prince Hal there is Percy if your father will do me the honor so if not let him kill the next Percy himself. I look to be either a duke or an earl, I assure you. Percy, I killed myself. I saw thee dead. Did so. Lord, Lord, how this world is given to lying. I grant you I was down and out of breath, and so was he. But we rose, both of us, on an instant, and fought a long hour. <laughs> well, does the prince go ahead? If a lie may do thee grace, I'll gild it with the happiest terms I have. Go ahead, claim the victory for yourself. And at last, now, now the king and the court come on and they present the prince. Go to Douglas and deliver him up. They've taken Douglas prisoner, obviously, and deliver him to his pleasure, ransomless and free. His valor shown upon our crest today hath taught us how to cherish such, such high deeds. He gives Douglas his freedom. The Scots, well, and they paid him off by voting, by voting to stay with England. <laughs> Two weeks ago, three weeks ago. <laughs> and that's it. That's, that's the, the wonderful compact, rich texture of this history play. The last line practically says, to be continued, because there is a Henry IV part two 
it's nothing like as good a play as Henry IV, Part I. And in it, Prince Hal gets in trouble with his father again, because when his father is sick and ailing and semi-conscious, Hal goes in to see him and sees the crown on the night table. Yeah, it's, it, you know, and he tries it on. I wonder what it would feel like. And just at that moment, his father rouses from his sleep and says, you're trying to take the, the night throne again. So Hal is in trouble, but Hen Henry does die, and Hal takes the throne. And as one of his last acts, he renounces Falstaff and the friends of his youth, and he sets them aside. I had no time for this. That was a something I did when I was young and foolish. I don't know you. I know thee not, old man, he says to Falstaff, who's waiting as the king goes by on his way to the coronation, the new king, Prince Hal, going to be crowned Henry V. And he's waiting. And the king says, I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. And it just breaks little Falstaff's heart. And when you see Henry V next week, what you're going to see is Falstaff is dying. He's in, he's in the tavern with his old friends, and they've given him a room upstairs. And Bardolph and Nim and Pistol, some of the some of the old gang, the old drinking buddies, are down below, sort of a death watch. And that's I, I reviewed the thing to be sure it played. By the way, I didn't I didn't I didn't want to say I had the the, the um, DVD if, I, if it didn't work, and some of these do hang up, but this one has played all the way through once, so it ought to play all the way through a second time, I hope. <laughs> the, um, it is just beginning, the play is just beginning to look real at the point at which Falstaff is dying. The old friends of um, Robert, you, you remember Robert Newton who played um, See, what did he play? He played Long John Silver in a version of, of uh, uh, Treasure Island. A really piratical, leering villain. Uh, an English actor. You'll know him as soon as you see him. And he plays Bardolph. And he comes in to the applause of the audience and sort of takes his bow and starts, starts speaking. And a sudden rainstorm has broken out. They, everybody made for the exits, but the rain stopped and they came back. And the actors kept right on playing. And when Bardolph and his, uh, I can't remember what his pistol and then he's talking to, but, and the, the other guy are talking, and they go over to where the, the tavern, where Falstaff is upstairs dying. And now the rain is dripping off. The roof onto them, and it's dark and it's gloomy. It's not brightly painted, and now it's becoming real. And you'll see that tr that that's one of the points of transition. The opening is you won't understand a word of what the actors are trying to tell you. Remember that Shakespeare lived in an age when the average man on the street was very hip to history. It was kind of a hobby of the average Elizabethan. He knew an awful lot about England's history. You couldn't do a J, you know, when Jay Leno sends somebody out into the street to talk, and they say, uh, 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 who, was, who was the president when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued? And they say, uh, Jimmy Carter? <laughs> well, you, you wouldn't have got that in Elizabethan England. They would have known the uh, Henry the Fourth, Henry the Richard the Second, Henry the Fourth, Henry the Fifth. They would have known that succession: Henry the Sixth, Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, Elizabeth. They would have known all about that. They would have known the succession. And so, it's not going to. They, all they have to do is remind them of the English having a claim 
on French territory, which is the, the basis for the war that Henry V wages against the French. It all comes from the fact that they are all descended, one way or the other, all these shirt tail relatives, descended from William the Conqueror. And he was French, and he owned a lot of land, and he had a lot of provinces that were under his sway, and the English claimed they still belonged to England, even though not enjoying France all that much, William the Conqueror had chosen to live out his years in England. I always wondered why. What was wrong with France at that period that he didn't like it well enough to go back home once he and make England a, a vassal nation? But instead, he chose to live out his life and to establish his kingdom in England. But the English, one, at a, one piece at a time, were losing, getting that land taken away from them by the French. And they resented it. And they looked up all kinds of fancy old laws and old documents of inheritance. And they had legal mumbo jumbo by the pound that they could recite that said that they had a right to that land in France, and the French were occupying it for them. <coughs> they had to be taken out. So the actors have to give a re re review of this. So what did they choose to do? They gave, the, Shakespeare gave the lines to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And you will recognize the actor who plays that, I can't remember his name now, who plays the Archbishop of Canterbury as an old, and a character actor from the 20th century from England. Um, he's been dead for a number of years now, but you will recognize him. And he has, he has his lines written on pieces of parchment that he's pretending to carry as, as the proof of the king, but those are his lines. And when he drops them and they get out of order, they have, he and the whole cast have to hunt for the right page <laughs> so that he could carry on. And of course it makes hash out of the the history that he's trying to tell you. He keeps he keeps talking, he keeps saying, by Salic law, no female shall inherit the, you know. But you don't care. You don't care a bit about the, the legal justification. And you are you will be, I think, amused by the scene of the actors fishing for the lines that have been written. I was in a play once where that happened. I was playing the secretary in the, the Man Who Came to Dinner. And the young man, just back from the army in World War II, who was playing uh, Sheridan Whiteside, had not memorized his lines. And they were all over the stage on little pieces of paper, <laughs> hidden behind the cigar box, <laughs> hidden behind the telephone, hidden under the, the placemat. It, the, on the tray that the nurse brought in, and he would read one line, and then he would go to the next piece. He could remember where he was supposed to go. He would wheel his wheelchair over here, and then he would pick up the place now and read his next line. <laughs> and it was excruciating. Well, you will. I think. I think even if you've never had that experience, you will enjoy that scene. And that's the way they get over this deadly dull opening scene. It, what would be deadly dull to you? It would be just a recitation of something they already knew to uh, the audience of Shakespeare's day. Uh, you will see the narrator. I warned you of that. They go back to this device, although there is no narrator in most of Shakespeare's, the plays of his golden years, because it's a classical device. But there is a narrator. Oh, for a muse of fire, princes to act, and monk and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. But here you are. I've got to make do with an ordinary audience. <laughs> and he, he, twice he appears. He appears to open the play. Oh, you won't understand this either. <coughs> maybe. So maybe I better figure it on this. The gift that the French prince sends to the uh, Henry V. Prince Hal, now Henry V. What treasure has our cousin sent? And they open the cask, and it's tennis balls. <laughs> well, they played tennis in the England of Henry V. It was a different form of tennis. It used the wall on one side of the court. You could bounce the 
a real tennis, it's called, and it's still played in some places in England. I had a friend who was a real tennis expert back in the old days. And, but, and the balls were very hard, and they were covered with leather, like a, almost like a cricket ball. They didn't have as much bounce in, but you could take, you'd bounce them off the wall that had a sloping shed roof. You'd bounce them off part of the roof into the court there, and uh, that was part of the game. So he's sending him real tennis balls, and what he's doing is saying, have a game. You're just a you're just a kid. You're just you. I know your reputation as a playboy. Go play a game. Don't bother to come and try to fight with us. We're serious people. We're serious. And you're, you're a playboy. And it's a, it is a it is a nasty little insult. And that's when the gift of the tennis ball arrives. Why everybody gets so bent out of shape about it. And maybe you wouldn't understand that. Maybe you would. <laughs> but I hope you I hope you come for the movie because it is a rare treat. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>